Department of Rehab Services offering Mississippi ABLE accounts that provide individuals with disabilities the opportunity to save money in a tax advantage account without risk of losing public benefits. More at MississippiABLE.com. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, March 24th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, a pay raise for Mississippi teachers is set to become law. Then an update on recovery efforts after Tuesday's storms. And a new film looks at the 21st century integration of two Cleveland high schools. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Well, it's good to be back after two days of Supreme Court confirmation hearings. While we were gone, Mississippi's House of Representatives passed a plan to raise teacher pay in the state by an average of about $5,000 per year. This, the conclusion of a prolonged standoff over teacher pay between the two chambers of the state legislature. Now, a few weeks ago, House leaders allowed a Senate teacher pay bill to die in committee forcing the hand of the Senate Education Committee. Those senators met after hours on deadline day to pass an amended version of the House legislation that's now set to become law. As the proverbial dust clears, House Speaker Philip Gunn says he's glad it's his chamber's bill that's headed to the governor's desk. We've been very adamant that we uh, do something transformative for the teachers, and I believe that we did. We passed a bill that puts starting pay beyond the national average, beyond the southeastern average, which is something that everyone had believed would allow us to recruit and retain teachers. And uh, we are very pleased that the, the plan that we put forward is the one that was ultimately adopted. Antonio Castanon Luna is director of the Mississippi Association of Educators. He speaks with MPB's Kobe Vance. We find ourselves in a historic moment for the state of Mississippi. Uh, This historic proposal, soon to be signed by the governor, is going to take our state from one of the lowest paid as it relates to educator pay to above the national average, one of the highest in the southeast. And it's going to represent a major opportunity for our state to recruit and retain high quality educators who are ultimately going to support our students and maximizing their life opportunities. This is a double investment in our state. It's going to help keep folks in the classroom now, and it's going to help support the opportunities for our students as they become a more prepared, better equipped workforce for the future of our state. There's been two plans that have been uh, competing throughout the entire session. There's been a plan by the House that would address the starting pay and the plan by the Senate that would address primarily pay for those who have more experience in the teaching field. What are your thoughts on uh, how the two plans have kind of combined in this final form? I find that ultimately we came out with the best deal for all educators. Through advocacy led by the Mississippi Association of Educators, we were able to engage legislators to highlight not only the need around starting pay for educators as we look to recruit folks into the classroom and into our public schools, but also the component of retaining highly qualified educators by ensuring that veteran educators continue to to feel the support through uh, significant increases through the career continuum. So ultimately, we continue to welcome the opportunity for ideas to be proposed, and we stand ready to continue to advocate to make sure that those ideas become legislation that actively impact our students and our educators, as we have seen with, with this combined proposal. Do you think this is going to be enough to start to incentivize teachers to come to Mississippi or keep Mississippi teachers in the state? I believe that this is an important down payment for our public schools, our students, and our educators. When we look at being able to advocate on behalf of public schools in Mississippi by highlighting that starting salaries are going to be above the national average, when we highlight that we are going to support veteran educators with significant salary increases throughout the career continuum, we certainly begin to open up a conversation 
around what else can we do for our students and our educators. So as the executive director of the Mississippi Association of Educators, I see this soon to be law as a down payment for, for our future in Mississippi. Uh, I believe that in coming years, we need to address what it would be to provide significant salary raises to the rest of the education community, meaning cafeteria workers, bus drivers, janitorial staff, additional education support personnel, because we know that those individuals also impact uh, our students' lives and ultimately their success. Uh, additionally, we know that we need to continue investing in community schools, making sure that our students all throughout the state have the supports and services that they need to be able to be uh, successful in the classroom. Uh, so again, this proposal really is a down payment for us to engage in a bigger conversation around what else can we do to continue pushing Mississippi forward uh, as it relates to public schools and public education. Antonio Castanon Luna is director of the Mississippi Association of Educators. More from the Capitol after the break. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. House lawmakers have revised their plan to eliminate the state income tax. Kobe Vance reports. House lawmakers have signed a conference report that would begin the elimination of the state income tax. Unlike previous versions of the legislation, it will not reduce the grocery tax, and it will take roughly 20 years to fully phase out the income tax. Representative Trey Lamar chairs the House Finance Committee. He says this would cut around $100 million in revenue each year. A billion dollars. We're talking, talking about taking $100 million of that, 10% of our excess. That's over and above the 6.1 to 6.2 we're going to set our budget at. We're talking about sending 10% of that back to the taxpayers. That would leave $900 million a year in today's dollars to spend on things like roads, bridges, and other needs of the state. The plan also has language that requires lawmakers to revisit the legislation within six years although it could be modified at any time before then. Speaker of the House Philip Gunn says his new draft should address any concerns held by Senate lawmakers related to future drops in revenue. That is one and a half percent of our budget. On a dollar, that's a penny and a half. We are contending, given the excess revenues, we can certainly afford to give a penny and a half on the dollar back to the taxpayers. In an email statement, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman says the Senate's tax plan is, quote, a conservative plan to return money to the taxpayers. He claims the House's plan uses outdated information and would underfund many projects in the state. Lieutenant Governor Hoseman goes on to say, quote, none of us were elected to grind government to a halt. We will not conduct ourselves in this way in the Mississippi Senate. He is calling on lawmakers to hold a joint public conference meeting to finalize the legislation. Speaker Gunn says if the House tax plan is adopted, the legislature can move forward with allocating ARPA funds. Kobe Vance, MPB News. Coming up, an update on recovery efforts after Tuesday's storms. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Emergency responders are taking stock of damage in the wake of Tuesday's storms that left some Mississippians without power. Mallory White is with the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. She spoke yesterday with Mississippi Edition producer Rob Lane. A lot of At this time, no fatalities have been reported. Two injuries were reported to us from overnight. One happened in Holmes County. Another one happened in Capaya County. Um, But I think, for the most part, we all came out very blessed in this. How about damage to homes? So this morning we had 12 counties report to us that they have some type of damage to their homes. What our teams are doing now in the damage assessment is we're classifying how significant that damage is. When FEMA looks at damage to homes, they classify it as either affected, minor, major, or destroyed. And so that's what we're looking at, and we're hoping to have some more definitive numbers by tomorrow morning. 
And do we know anything about uh, ongoing issues with with roads being out or power lines being out a result of as a result of uh, fallen tree limbs or anything else? I don't want to speak for the Department of Transportation, but I do know that they have been out clearing the roadways. And as far as power outages, we have actually seen a significant um, increase in getting those getting power restored, which is great. Um, just yesterday, around three o'clock. We had um, probably 25,000 without power, and that number this morning was about 7,000. So we really do appreciate those crews, the linemen that are out there working to restore it. And not only that, um, people who are staying off the road, so MDOT can clear the debris, and um, those linemen can restore the power. And we should note that we're talking here in the sort of late afternoon hours on Wednesday the 23rd. If you realize that your home has been damaged or as, as a result of this and you haven't reported it yet, uh, what's the, the proper channels to go through? So the first thing you need to do if you have damage to your home is file an insurance claim. Go ahead and get that started. But also let us know about the damage and you can do so by going to our website msema.org and there's a tab that, that is called self-report. Click that tab, choose the county that you live in, and fill out the form. We would love it if you upload photos as well. And the photos that we're looking for are damage to your walls, damage to your roof or ceiling. We're looking at the structural integrity of the home. We don't need to see photos of maybe a fence or a doghouse blown over. We need to see the home. And if your home's all right, but your power is still out and you don't know when it'll come back on, what's best practice? Definitely, if you have a generator, keep it outdoors, keep it from getting wet or anything like that. Um, we do encourage people to not um, open your refrigerator if that's possible, um, but definitely take those precautions. Um, I know for us during Hurricane Katrina, we had to clean out our deep freeze pretty quickly and start cooking that. That's why we encourage people to have disaster kits with non-perishable food in it um, to sustain them. Um, I do know, I just checked the power outages. We're now at about 5,500, and so they're moving quickly on that. Uh, we just ask for patience for the linemen as they go out there and continue to work to restore. Anything else that's important to note at this juncture as the state tries to once again bounce back from an adverse weather event? So MEMA uh, opened a call center. Uh, as of Wednesday afternoon, we encourage people that if you have immediate unmet needs, this isn't for those who have inconveniences. This is for real unmet needs that you, we could maybe assist you with, food, medicine, um, tarps, things like that. We encourage you to call 1-800-445-6362. Our call center will be open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., Saturday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and closed on Sundays. And so we do encourage those people who have had significant damage to their homes, if they have any unmet needs, reach out to our call center. We have wonderful stakeholders that help us from the Mississippi BOAD, the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, and our faith-based community. Coming up, a new film looks at the 21st century integration of two Cleveland high schools. And you just heard from Mallory White, who's with the Mississippi Emergency Management Association. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Delta State University this evening is hosting a screening of the new documentary, Never Say Die, the story of Eastside High. The film examines the merging of two Cleveland public high schools after a federal judge ruled in 2016 the schools were illegally racially segregated. The merge resulted in the dissolution of Eastside High, a predominantly black school that lacked resources sources but was rich in history and culture. Eric Elson is the documentary's executive producer. We wanted to, you know, commemorate and um, tell the story, but once we got down and started to do the various interviews with the community stakeholders and folks that were pillars in the community, 
it, it was something deeper there. You know, it was a tradition. You know, it was, um, you know, a community. And so it was a lot more there to tell the story. And we wanted to share the story with the world, you know, how this school wasn't just a school. It was a, a family, you know, and we're talking about desegregating the school or se segregated schools in the 21st century, you know, folks say that's unheard of, but, you know, it, it happened, you know. So this was very meaningful where it just wasn't a story, but also it, it, it unpacked the where a community bounded together for change, you know. But we talk about race and culture, but also we talk about a community coming together to make a difference. So basically, we have two high schools, one predominantly black, one predominantly white, and a judge says that these schools have never been integrated and it must happen, and there was a time period in which to get it done. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, the community came together. They created a strategy. Some folks wanted the change, some folks didn't. And but, you know, at the end of the day it happened. The community learned a lot from it. You know, a lot of folks were hurt, but you know, through hurt and pain you learn lessons. You you create strategies and you, you move forward. So what I was amazed as an outsider coming in and seeing and learning and, and, and establishing relationships, you see how strong that community was. You see how resilient the students were. You see how racial barriers were broken down. And, you know, is it still room for growth? Most people will say yes. But is does the community have the courage to keep moving forward? Yes. But, you know, you learn from the past. And the, the motivation behind this documentary is just getting to – to scratch the surface of the legacy and the story of Eastside High School and what it meant to the community. Did you talk to whites as well as blacks? Yes, we talked to, you know, both sides. And, you know, the, the it was a lot of powerful stories, a lot of understanding about race and culture and and racism and how, you know, things were moved forward, whether it was school choice or strategies that was in place. But the most important thing is, you know, we have to understand our history and to move forward. And, you know, the, to the community of Eastside, there's a lot more uh, more stories that need to be told. You know, um, Coach Seabury told a story that, you know, they, as students, they got out of uh, school and they picked cotton to, and, the, and the students purchased the bus for other students and other classmates to get back and forth to school. That's very powerful, you know, to hear. And so the pride and the culture of the East Side community it runs so deep that, you know, I, I learned so much, and these are stories that I want my children to hear and other people across the world to understand what it means to have pride. What do you want to get across? We know your passion for this film and all the people that you talk to and the great impression that they left upon you and what you want to get across on the screen, what do you want people to leave feeling after they view this? I want people to leave feeling inspired. You know, I want people to to, to know that we can storytell from the lens or the point of view as blacks or African Americans, you know, I, I believe, you know, culture is important. And, you know, that legacy of Eastside High, that should always shine through black and gold. And the stories of resilience, the stories of pride, the stories of of community, that's what should should power through. And as we talk about some of the complexities of modern day, whether it's education, uh, racism, um, I, I, I want everybody to know, you know, through those hurdles, we could push through it and be strong and, and do a lot through collaboration and supporting each other. How long did it take to make this film? Uh, it took us a couple of years, you know, um, because you know initially we we came down to film you know uh, 
the school and just to see and set up a couple interviews. But in the midst of interviewing the white community, in the midst of interviewing the black community, some of the stories were just so powerful, we had to do a deeper dive. And so that's where, you know, we really dived in because we're talking about uh, desegregating the school in the 21st century. You know, I'm a, a lifelong educator, been in the school, working in the school system for 23 years. And, you know, for me to hear that and, and, and process that and unpack that is just very deep and powerful. You know, the Eastside community has a, a, a big hole in their heart. You know, East, they, you know, some folks feel like Eastside was taken away from them. You're talking about r- rituals and traditions that the community look forward to. And that's it's traumatic. You know, some folks may have some um, experiences that there's, that's unresolved or some hurt and pain. So this gives the community uh, a, a piece or a, a strategy to, you know, embrace some of that hurt and some of those experiences and know that, hey, we can continue to share. And, you know, this is something I want the future generations to understand how powerful Eastside was. Eric Elston is executive director of the new documentary, Never Say Die, the story of Eastside High. The film will be screened at 6 this evening on the campus of Delta State University. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Creature Comforts. At 10, it's an autocorrect. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. See you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi edition only on MPB Think 